So hello everyone, before I get to uh, Fedora on RISC-V, I just want to introduce where Fedora fits with the upstream open source communities, uh, Red Hat and CentOS. Now, Fedora's uh, motto is freedom, friends, features, and first. And Fedora is a popular Linux distribution with a focus on leading innovation, freedom, and integrating new technologies early. And you can see where RISC-V is a natural fit, because it's an innovative new technology. And we see it as extending freedom and openness down into the firmware and, and one day maybe even into the hardware. Now, as you know, upstream Linux communities and Linux developers write software. And Fedora takes this and we integrate it into uh, our rolling release, which we call Rawhide. And every six months or so, Rawhide is branched into a stable release, and Fedora 28 was released last week. And Fedora releases are actually pretty good for developer laptops because you, know, you are on the cutting edge of, of new software, and if that's what you want, then it's great to run on your laptop, and I run, the, run it on my laptop. Now, every few years, Red Hat Enterprise Linux is forked from Fedora. RHEL 6, Red Hat Enterprise Linux 6, was forked from Fedora 12 in 2010. And uh, RHEL 7 was forked from Fedora 18 in 2013. And RHEL itself uh, is maintained for between 10 and 13 years of support. <coughs> New features get backported to RHEL during its lifetime. Uh, and it also offers a completely stable ABI that um, independent software vendors can write software to for the whole of that 10 to 13 years. Now, you can pay for RHEL, and please do because it pays my salary. But if you don't want to pay for RHEL, you can also use rebuilds of RHEL. The most popular one is probably CentOS, but there's also Scientific Linux, and there are some others. <coughs> Red Hat has a very, very strong policy called upstream first. Red Hat and Fedora have this policy. We don't maintain our own out-of-tree major features. They must all go upstream. And this benefits open source as a whole, and Red Hat is the second largest contributor to the Linux kernel. We make huge contributions to GNU tools, Eclipse, GNOME, OpenStack, Kubernetes, and much more. We at Red Hat are really committed to open source, and we have a history of acquiring with multi-million dollar purchases, proprietary software companies, and then open sourcing their code. Some of the companies that we've recently acquired, you can see on this diagram. You might think that we can't really make any money by buying companies and giving away software and open sourcing everything, but in fact, this strategy has been incredibly successful. About 90% of all Fortune Global 500 companies run Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Red Hat Enterprise Linux um, has about $3 billion in revenue every year. And we've been increasingly profitable for over a decade. We have 11,400 employees. And as you can see, all of our charts are, as they say, up and to the right, which is good. OK, let's get to the meat of this. Fedora on RISC-V. These are just some facts and figures. So the final bootstrap started off in uh, fe uh, about the 5th of February this year. It took two months. We built 16,700 packages. That resulted in about 12,700 binary packages. And we currently have a build farm, which uh, has, I say two, but actually it's one and a half uh, high five unleashed boards, very generously donated by um, Sci5. The, the one and a half, because Fedora got one, and then we, we share the glibc uh, board, which DJ Delory has. We also have, um, these figures are out of date, I think we now have 13 Kermu instances, and I think we have five Intel servers. And on this build farm, we're building Fedora Rawhide and Fedora 28 packages in parallel. Plus, we have a thing which we call Shadow Koji, which takes packages that are built for Fedora, and rebuilds them uh, for RISC-V. We have uh, bootable disk images, which you can download. And they're widely used by developers who um, want to experience RISC-V. It's been a great way for, for people to get into RISC-V for the first time. Um, our IRC channel there, 
please do join up if you want to talk to us. And um, a couple of links there. But to be honest, the best thing is just to go to your favorite search engine and type in Fedora RISC V. Now, the final part of this talk, I want to talk about RISC V's prospects on the server. Now, the server market is worth about $80 billion annually. The, the, these figures come from IDC, and they don't include motherboards that are sold and then are assembled by companies. And actually, that's quite a large part of the server market because cloud um, companies like uh, Amazon and Google build their own hardware. But if you just look at, if you just look at um, shipped servers, it's about $80 billion a year, and about 3 million physical servers are shipped every year. And if you do the math, that's $27,000 per server. So you can see the numbers are skewed by some very, very large server systems. Of those, x86 servers are about 85% of the server market by value. There's also a synergy between handsets and servers, because the more phones and other handsets, tablets, and laptops that get sold, the more servers are needed to run the services that those phones need. Now, there is a real need here that open hardware might satisfy. Uh, one particular issue is with real time. Um, it's a particular problem with Intel's uh, hardware because of the opaque power management and system mode interrupts, which just interrupt everything and destroy your real time guarantees. Also, from our customers, we're hearing concerns about whether they can actually trust their hardware. But make no mistake, although there's an opportunity here, it's going to be incredibly hard for RISC V to enter this market. But at least what you can do is you can avoid the mistakes that are being made by a certain very popular, widely licensed ISA vendor that you probably have heard about. So most server installations these days are automated at scale. So servers from multiple vendors are slotted into racks. Tools like OpenStack Director, Ironic, Bifrost, the Foreman, and so on are used to install hypervisors on multiple racks of servers all at once. The cloud provisioning software is then used to install virtual machines and containers on demand. Humans are not involved in this process very much. Now, Red Hat ships a single kernel, a kernel image on x86, which runs on every x86 machine from all the vendors and inside um, virtual machines. It boots on all the past machines and some future machines, and as I say, from all vendors. There's no fiddling around with U-boot forks or downloading an out-of-tree driver for some obscure hardware that you've got. Everything must be in that single um, kernel image that we ship. Now, on x86, this is kind of easy because there are standards for boot uh, and for describing the hardware up to the operating system. And these standards work for all operating systems, including Windows and other operating systems. So what mistakes could RISC-V make which could shut it out of the server market completely? Well, I've got a few on this slide. You could, for example, require manual intervention to choose the right bootloader and kernel per vendor. That's not going to work in the server environment when, where everything is highly automated. You could require out-of-tree drivers or patches. Remember that Red Hat has the upstream first policy, and our kernels come from upstream. You might have no standards for servers or constantly changing standards. Um, you might not have an organization which is providing direction on server standards or enforcing that. You might keep changing fundamental bits of the ISA so that a single kernel image can't be made. That's a particular problem if, for example, in the future, compressed and uncompressed um, both become sort of equally popular, so we can't support a single kernel image that works on both. You might keep breaking ABIs. Remember, we've got to support this for 13 years. So that kernel's got to work on an ISA in 13 years' time. So if the ISA keeps changing, everywhere you've got a, vert every got a vertical line, they've got an ABI, potentially. So if, that, if those ABIs keep getting broken, we can't support it for 13 years, you're not going to be able to enter the server market. And the final two points. You might have standards, but those standards might only work for Linux. And 
it might exclude other OS vendors. Now, you're going to think this is surprising, but I'm going to tell you that to enter the server market, having Windows running on RISC V at some point in the future is going to be important. There will be many customers who will not consider a new architecture unless it runs software that they're familiar with, and that software will often be Windows. We have Windows now on ARC64 servers, by the way. And the final point, you might make developer boards, but the developer boards might be too expensive for developers. Um, now, actually, you know, RISC-V is doing OK here, because we have, the, we have the developer boards. They are expensive, but the prices we expect will come down. The, the particular culprit here is basically power, where you can't even enter the, the game without spending like $4,000. Now, if you avoid all of those mistakes, and you provide cheap hardware with decent enough performance, and all the management features, and all the other lovely stuff that we're used to, then RISC-V does have a, a chance in the server market. I was going to give you a demo of Fedora running on, on, on um, RISC-V, but I couldn't do it because I couldn't bring, I couldn't attach my laptop. But I, I took a few screenshots. We also, of course, have all the graphical stuff. The screenshots are necessarily boring because you know, we want it to just work exactly like x86 uh, or other architectures. So if, if you want to see the demo, I'm going to be sitting down there afterwards, and, and I'll show it to you. Um, and because I've got one minute and 52 seconds left, I'm going to just show you a few extra, um, extra things. But as I say, if you want to find out about Fedora and RISC-V, the best thing is just to search for Fedora and RISC-V. Just a couple of extra, extra things. That's our build farm at the moment. Um, I think we've got 15 uh, servers in there, two high five boards you can probably see, and, and the rest are QMU instances. Uh, and that's another shot from the build, for, uh, from the build system. You can, you can see the builds going through there. And the final one here, this is, you've already actually seen this because Palmer showed it, but uh, this, is, this is my colleague DJ's uh, glibc development system. It's amazing. He's got, he's got his uh, high five board. He's got an, uh, an SSD. He's got the Vertex board there. He's got some other stuff. I don't know what that red one is. I don't know. I think he's got a graphics card. It's incredible. All right, so I'll be sitting down there. That's probably the easiest way, and I, th I think I've run out of time anyway. But um, thanks for listening to me. Can you be more specific what you mean Windows has to run? Well, I mean that there will be customers who won't want to move to a new architecture unless they can bring some familiar management tools and software that they have. And, and for some of those customers, that's going to be Windows. But what I'm really saying is don't, don't make your standards depend on Linux only. The standards must be, they, they, they must be, um, you know, they must work for all operating system vendors out there. No, well, I, I really mean that, that um, eventually we do actually want to have, um, you know, Perhaps Windows, perhaps Google's new operating system, perhaps BSD-derived operating systems. And we don't want to have standards that only work for Linux. So the particular standard I'm thinking of here is Device Tree. Okay? Um, Device Tree is essentially a data dump of internal structures from Linux. And it's fine for Linux, but it just doesn't work for Windows. So Windows will want UEFI and ACPI. So we'll work on that. All right, I'm, I'm going to finish it there, but thanks for listening to me. Okay.